audience participation is next. Let me remind everybody, please step to the microphone, uh, sign in, please state your name and address so the clerk can have it for the minutes. Council Rule 21 does limit each speaker to five minutes and each subject to 15. And even though my official timekeeper, Mr. Trutchell, is absent, that will be enforced. Thank you. Any audience, any member of the audience wish to address council, please step forward. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone here in this room tonight for their service to the community. I'm here to speak about the clandestine drugs. Joe, you need your name. Oh, name, my name is Joseph T. Sharp, 559 North High Street. I'm sorry, I should have known that. Everybody knows you, but a few times before. <laughs> Still a little nervous. <laughs> Well, I'm here to address the clandestine drug labs. First, I would question the need for this law. And what I mean by that is I, I've asked the police department, I've asked the law director's office, and I heard the radio even ask the council members, how many drug meth drug labs have there been in Chillicothe in the past two years? And I haven't gotten the exact number. Pat just said earlier that there was 20, I think you said 20 raids. Captain Banfield said drug raids in the county. I don't know if that's meth labs. We don't know if those meth labs are in houses, cars, backpacks. How many meth labs have there been in Chillicothe that, it, that, it, that we have to give this kind of attention to? I'm aware of, I believe, five, I think. I'm not sure of that, and we don't have those numbers. And of those meth labs, two of those meth labs, the one guy got caught in one house, and then a week later, he was involved in the second meth lab. So that's just an interesting point I thought. Second of all, if we don't know the number of these meth labs to decide at what number and at what point does it become necessary for us to enact this legislation, how many injuries, how many first responders have been injured from this, from these meth labs? How many injuries to people on the scene? How many injuries to the folks that have rented the houses afterwards? That would be some good information to base whether we need this, whether this is necessary or not. Uh, I passed out some paperwork. I'm sorry about that, Nancy. I didn't realize Pat passed out the identical paperwork, the meth lab cleanup. And I have a couple extras if anybody in the audience would like some of these. There, there's some pretty good points in there. Another point I, I would make is I pay taxes. I pay taxes for the police and fire to respond. And that's what they do on the drug raids. They show up and they respond. Then they, they do what's necessary to apprehend the criminal there. So I don't know why I should be paid, paying twice for that service. That's like saying, well, if you go to uh, Kmart and you, if the police respond to Kmart for a shoplifter, then Kmart should pay you because that police officer had to respond there. He had to drive there and he had to spend man hours there. Maybe we should look into more, more fees, and let's make it fair for everyone. It, if anything, the landlord shouldn't have to pay. If you are going to pass this, the landlord shouldn't have to pay. The tenant's the criminal. The tenant's the one who, who perpetrated the act and, and had to do that. He should pay. And I understand, Nancy and, and Pat, what you're saying about we need to be uh, responsible with our finances. I, I agree. And I understand when you say you don't want the city, the city shouldn't have to clean my rental property. I agree. I don't want the city cleaning my rental property. I can do it very fine myself. Thank you very much. And I can do it cheaper. And part of that is, on saving the money, when the police respond and the fire department respond, there's different types of meth labs. When, when you hear meth lab, the average citizen who hasn't, hasn't been to your meetings thinks beakers and Bunsen burners and... Uh, and white jackets and explosive barrels of drugs. We don't know if that's the type of meth lab problem we've had in Chillicothe or not. Of course, we don't know how many meth labs we've had. But I believe the ones we've had are the shake and bakes. Those are water bottles like you all have. They put a little bit of chemicals in there. It's dangerous. When they add that battery acid in there, that could catch fire or it could blow up. When I say blow up, you're talking a little bottle like that. It might blow their finger off. It could put their eye out, the person that's handling it at that time. That is dangerous. But these aren't 55-gallon drums that are going to blow up a city block. They're not going to blow up a house. 
Now, that's not every. I understand it's not every meth lab raid, but I don't know which type we're having. I would argue if the police are going to come in in the fire, is that the type of lab they found? What's the rate to be charged for that type of cleanup? The only time that bottle is dangerous is when you're shaking it. Release the pressure. Shake it. Release the pressure. The police can come. The fire can come. Make their drug raid. If there's just a plastic bottle like that brewing, put your safety gear on. Release the pressure. Arrest the criminal. Leave all that toxic crap there. You don't have to clean that out. That's the landlord's job to clean that out. And that's kind of what they do. There's another difference between cleaning up and neutralizing. When they first respond, they're not cleaning up. We're not paying anyone. The, the fire and police aren't cleaning our houses. They're neutralizing the crime scene. They're anything, any active ingredients, they're removing all the active ingredients that could be combined to make a meth lab, taking it outside and neutralizing. That, that's a, the difference. So we're not paying them to clean. We're paying them to neutralize it. So you have a minute. If you look at this paper, you'll see on there, indoor air in most homes, especially those with cigarette smokers, will usually exceed the health-based minimum risk standards. So if, if you guys make me have my house tested, my, my tenant's house, if there's smokers there, I'm not going to pass the air test because it's simply a smoke. And I encourage everyone to read this because there's a lot, of, a lot of good points in there. And I guess my final thing I'd like to say, <clears throat> a byproduct that you may not be aware of of this law is you're telling a landlord, if you rent to someone and there's a, a lab there, they're going to charge you $5,000 just for showing up. Well, then that tells me, and you say all the time, you should do a better job of screening. So you're saying, screen, if you've ever been arrested for drugs, I'm not renting to you. I shouldn't rent to you because you've been arrested for drugs. You're, you're, you're an addict. It, in that case, then your daughter shouldn't live there. She's on drugs. And if, if that's the case, if you're telling landlords that they're going to have to pay three to $5,000 every time they show up, first thing I'm going to say is, whoa, if you've got a drug record, a criminal record of any kind, I'm not going to rent to you. Now, that could, that could spread. And is that what we want? I know in an ideal, in an ideal world, there would be no drug addicts in our community. But there are folks, and I, I would dare to say somebody else besides me in this audience has a family member who has a drug addiction problem. So that's a byproduct you might not be realizing. And when the landlords all get together and say, first thing they ask is, do you have a drug record? Have you ever been arrested for drugs? Whether you've been rehabilitated or done your time or went through rehab, I'm not going to rent to you because I'm not going to risk being charged $5,000 when the police and fire show up because they have to carry chemicals out to the street. I don't want our officers carrying chemicals out to the street. I, I can take care of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Any other members of the audience wish to address council? My name is Karen Hoffman, and I'm the president of AFSCME Local 1562, which represents um, city employees. I would like to address tonight the issue of the transit administrative clerk and the transportation coordinator. I've expressed my concerns about these jobs on a number of occasions, and I just want to go on record once again. Um, I had expressed during civil service meetings that these jobs should be classified positions within the AFSCME bargaining unit. They're working side by side, other members there who are bargaining unit members, they're doing work that is similar in scope, um, which has always sort of been the litmus test for whether or not a job would be considered a bargaining unit job. The transportation coordinator, in my opinion, is, is nothing more than, than clerical in scope. There, I, I, it's, the job descriptions are are sort of convoluted. They speak of supervisory skills and shift leaders. They, the shift leaders do most of what I believe the transportation coordinator, some of those duties, and our shift leaders, which are supervisory, are still in the bargaining unit. The positions are not positions of trust. They're not fiduciary positions. The administrative clerk states that it is a classified non-bargaining management position and shall serve at the pleasure of the mayor. Those terms just contradict each other 
greatly. There cannot be classified service that serves the pleasure of the mayor. Classified service would indicate that there has to be a competitive way to decide who gets that job. Serving at the pleasure of the mayor is an appointed position. I think it has to be one or the other. Um, the job description um, for both of these lists that the person, that, that it would be, um, I don't know if it says required, but beneficial for both to have social services degrees. And clearly they're both clerical or administrative. Um, the clerk is in the hierarchy of administrative jobs is what I would consider the ground floor. We currently have a secretarial position there, which is the payroll person, the accounts payable person that deals with all of the, the um, really, um, the information regarding employees. I, the, the term eludes me, but I, you know what I'm saying, the, the, the term that dealing with people's social security numbers and all those things. She is a secretary. That's kind of the top rung of the clerical positions within our bargaining unit. That position is in our bargaining unit. So for a clerk, which is an entry level park position, to not be in the bargaining unit um, just seems a little backwards to me. Um, and again, I believe that that, that sentence, there's just a, a, a lot of concerns. And I would like to ask that you not waive the three read rule tonight because I really believe that there are things that need to be cleaned up. Um, I have received calls from my members because they want to apply for this job and the way it currently stands, um, that's not gonna happen. So um, having said that, uh, please consider that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Salford. back again. My name is Jake McNeely. I live at 7 Belcrest Lane. Tonight I'd like to talk about the condition of Lot 4 houses in Chillicothe, Ohio. And this pertains a lot to the different wards. I'm not picking on anybody in particular because in uh, future councilmen uh, meetings I'll be addressing different properties in Chillicothe. The first one is that I'd like to address is that 605 Allen Avenue. It's a burned out dump. All you have to do is go down Pyatt Avenue, you can't mess it. It's been a dump for months. Now it's all burned out, trash laying everywhere. I'd like to know what the status of that is. Does anybody know what's being done with it? Uh, Mrs. Ford has sent a notice to the property owner. That's as much as I can do right now. We're not taking legal action, have it taken yeah, down? Yeah, that's law director right now. Law director, do you have an answer to that? I think somebody ought to take a look at that. You know, drive by it. You'll see what I'm talking about. The reason I ask about that is I own a piece of property nine houses away from there. My house is immaculate. I don't want that dumped down the street. Next one, 523 Bellevue Avenue. Sorry, Mr. Sherman, but this one's yours. Three years ago, this council passed for a person to build a pole barn in the house on this property right by Bishop Leger. Not all of you, I mean, there's some new people here who didn't vote on this, but there is people here who voted on this. If you go by this property today, the pole barn's not down. I said in this council meeting, it was promised that the house and the pole barn would be done in one year. The purpose of the pole barn before the house was, was to make trim for the house. Right now, the pole barn's not done, but it's full of campers, junk, old cars, trash sitting around, and the uh, house, they dug a basement, now it's a frog pond, full of water, health hazards, safety hazards, hope some kid don't fall in there, I hope an adult don't. We need to look into that property, I think the law director ought to file a lawsuit and say, either finish the house in one year as promised, within the next six months, finish this property, or you got to tear it down. They came and asked you to do this. They said it did do it in one year. It's been over three years and nothing's done. It's time to make a move on that property. The other thing is I want to touch a little bit on the uh, landlord issue since I am a landlord. 
I'd like to know what is the police role in this ordinance? Is there anything in the ordinance that says the police is going to be involved to do anything? And the reason I get into this is, let me point out, I own a property that I just recently bought at 793 Adams Avenue, right next door at 805. The woman that owns that property is in Westmoreland. She knows nothing. I feel sorry for her. I know her personally. She owns the property. You got five drug dealers in the house. The police drive up and down the street. There's needles everywhere. If you want to send the police down there to pick up the needles, you might as well let them sit there all day. I'm tired of the needles. I'm working on this house. I'm tired of the needles. Something needs to be done to this 805. Like, say, the woman, she's the property owner. If they make some meth in there or something, what are you going to do to her? Go to her and say, you got to clean up the property? She's just going to sit there and look at you. But she don't know you. She don't know nothing. I feel sorry for her, especially with this ordinance. Believe me, I'm not against drugs. I think we ought to eliminate them all. My idea is a little bit different than yours. I think we ought to do what to do in Malaysia, take a hand off. Take this one next and then a foot and then a foot. But that's my opinion. But this 805 something needs to be done. I've turned into the city about the electric falling off the house. You can close that house down right now. But the engineering department, which you are reported it to, will go down there and tag that house. They have to leave that house because it's unsafe. Nothing happened. They stole my electric meter during the snowstorm. You can see their footprints. I followed them. I stood out in the alley and seen the footprints right through the back door. Called the police. What did I get? I got a tag on dispatcher that says, Sir, you're not allowed to call 911. I said, Somebody's stealing my electric. Don't you understand? They plug my electric meter in theirs, take theirs out. They got free electric. What do you mean I can't call 911? Well, you got to call this private number. I said, I don't have a phone book with me. I said, What do you do then? Let them steal all my electric? And I paid the bill. So they send the policeman down. He goes over, knocks on the door, and they said, oh, we didn't see anybody the electric meter. So he comes back, tells me this, and I said, what are you going to do? You know it's there. You can see the footprint. He said, well, I'd have to get a search warrant, and I don't want to go through all that. So what good is the police? I reported it. They didn't do nothing. Now the strange part is, 10 minutes later, they, they knock on my door said, oh, here's your electric meter. We want to make sure we're good neighbors with you. We don't want you to turn this into the police. Can you believe that? I got a bad thank God, but it was because they didn't want me to report to the police. But here's a poor woman who knows nothing, and you're going to go after her. That ordinance has got some flaws. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying it's not. Uh, the other part is, if you've ever been in small claims court, three to four months to the people out. I've been there. I was just there last week. And the thing is, if it's three to four months, is the courts going to get along with this ordinance and give me 48 hours? If I make a dumb mistake and get the wrong person in there, is that court going to give me the right to throw everybody out of that house in 48 hours? As it is now, it's three to four months. Is that fair with this ordinance? I don't think so. Like I said, there's some flaws. There's some good parts. But you got to think about that. If I can't get them out in 48 hours, then i got to put up with them for four months. That's not fair. That's the only thing i got to say. See you again about some houses. I need to work on the ones I told you tonight. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Any other audience, any members of the audience wish to address counsel? My name is Whitey Coates, 460 Summit Drive. I'm here to represent... Um, it's Chillicothe Creek Commission. We sort of fly under the radar. Uh, we do a lot of work. We get sweaty. We dig holes. We plant trees. We prune. We mulch. We weed. And some of these things affect the community aesthetically and some financially. And we wanted to see, we wanted you to see who we were face to face. I brought some with me. Uh, I'm a for I have a forestry background. Mike Gauss is on the commission. He has a forestry background. Dave Kenner is our new uh, director of parks and recreation. He has a different background, different perspective. I'm sure he's going to be of real value to us 
Ann Bonner is the urban forester for this section of Ohio. She covers 16 counties. She's our mother hen. She tells us what's good and what's bad and keeps us on the straight and narrow. Terry McFadden is a self-taught forester and naturalist and a very hard worker. And Mike Green is the services director. He's the keys to the kingdom. He has the manpower. He has the free spade. He has the auger. He hopefully has some money, and without him, we can't do a, a, a whole lot. <coughs> Seven of us are are appointed by the mayor. We serve alternate uh, uh, terms. The tree ordinance is complicated, but it's a very good one. It needs a little tweaking. I'll give you three quick uh, statements about the tree ordinance. Number one, trees on the city's land and the city's parks belong to the city. They're property of the city, and it's the city's responsibility to take care of them. The trees on the rights of way in the city are the property of the city. The responsibility for the care is the homeowner. There's a big tree on a right of way. It, it's taken down. It costs $600. The homeowner writes the check for $600, goes into his house muttering under his breath. There's an element of unfairness there, and it's a bad PR. The third thing that's important in the tree commission is the permit system. The homeowner cannot plant a tree, prune a tree, remove a tree without the permission of the tree commission. That gives the city the con control over the future of the urban forest. This is how the permit system works. There's an issue with a tree. It's in a front yard, not sure if it's on the right of way, not sure if it's off the right of way. Uh, so the homeowner or his tree care person calls the service department. This is the name, this is the address, this is the phone number, this is the issue with that tree. A form is filled out, the tree commission is called. Two of us, we work in teams of two on a rotating basis. Two of us go to the address measure the street, measure the tree. If it's off the right of way, the issue is done. It's not our jurisdiction. If it's on the right of way, we talk to the homeowner, we get their side of the story, we give them our side of the story, we're advocates for the tree, we approve or we deny the permit. Le trees have flowers, they have leaves, they have fruit, they all drop, they all make litter. Leaves in the eaves, and bird droppings on your car just as you're going to Sunday school are not valid reasons for taking down the tree. We are advocates for the tree. The Emerald Ash Borer, switching gears here, is a real problem uh, in the United States. Michigan and Ohio have lost millions of trees to the ash borer. How does that affect Chillicothe? Well, there's 50 ash trees in Yacht Yankee Park. Last spring, we took down 13 of them. No cost to the uh, to the city because of uh, one of our tree commission members and AEP and ASPO uh, tree pruning. There are 35 more trees to uh, to come down. Of the ones we took down, we were paid $800 by Gladfelder. We used that to buy four trees to put on University Drive. Uh, look at uh, Water Street, Second Street, Main Street. There's 50 more ash trees. They're all going to die. They're all going to have to come down. We've prioritized how we think they should come down. We'll be glad to, to be there when they're taken down, give what help we can. If the city crews can take them down, it should be done before the sap rises because that's easier. If the city cannot handle the trees, they're 12 to 16 inches in diameter, then you'll have to uh, contract them to get them out. The first four trees we take out are on West 2nd Street by the parking lot. There's two trees there, two across the street. There's two at uh, Carlstown House. There's a tree in front of the uh, LCNB Bank that is an actual disgrace to Mother Nature. And there's a tree at uh, Huntington Bank that uh, needs to come on now. Uh, there could be some serious expenses involved there. We have a nursery on Rennick Avenue. We, if we buy a street tree to put it in the ground, it costs 180 to $200. Um, it has to have a certain size, a certain height, and a certain diameter. Uh, we 
because if you put in small trees and the kids get into a sword fight with the tree, the tree loses and the, and the tree is shot. So, you, so we buy trees. We have a nursery. You can buy trees for $60. You can grow them in the nursery for a few years and put those out on the street. Then you save quite a bit of money. We're about to uh, uh, restock uh, the nursery this year. We have some money in a budget, first time in 15 years and some of the money will go to restocking the nursery. University Drive, there are 64 trees on University Drive. There's 32 on either side of the street. They're matched across the street. They're also matched from the top to the bottom. So if it's crab tree, crab tree, walnut, cherry, whatever. Uh, over the years, some of them have been vandalized. Some of them have died. The crab apples are not very hardy. Uh, we're in the process of redoing those trees to restore that symmetry in the 64 trees. South Hickory Street, um, from 7th to 8th Street, there's room for 30 trees. Uh, they have wide tree lawns. This In November, we put in 10 trees from our nursery, uh, mostly small trees under the wires. The rest of the street uh, has no wires, tall trees for tall spaces. We're going to buy 20 trees and put them in hopefully this spring. Inventorying street trees. <coughs> in the east end, there are 840 places on the rights of way that will take a tree. There are already 172 trees there. 600 spaces could be planted, planted with trees. They're not all prime spaces. They won't all take tall trees. Uh, if you think trees don't make a difference, take a walk down Caldwell Avenue on a hot summer morning, drive down to um, the east end, pick any presidential street, and walk that street and see if you can see if there's a difference. We're uh, inventorying the whole city. It will take several years. Eventually, we'll know what all the trees are in the city, if there's a, a problem with trees. Where the planting spaces are when we want to add to the uh, canopy of the of the city, the Millennium Grove. I don't know if you know about the Millennium Grove at all. Um, I wouldn't know where it was, and I wouldn't have been there if I hadn't been working on it for 13 years. It's by the Chevrolet place to the river. That's on seven acres. It was donated to us. It has a hundred trees with historic background. They were donated to us. Each tree has a Six by six, six foot post, they were donated to us. Each tree has a five by seven plate on it identifying the tree. My favorite is one that says Red Bud, Circus Canon Densis, 1838, Trail of Tears, 4,000 Cherokee Indians died being pushed to Oklahoma by General Winfield Scott. The trees are divided into seven groups. These are important to Ohio, American history, Civil War North, Civil War South, presidents, famous men, famous women. You may not know that um, you should learn something every day, and, and I will teach you this. Today is the 178th anniversary of either the first or second day of the Siege of the Alamo. It depends on which history book you read. Two brothers from the east end of Chillicothe from a farm were killed at the Alamo. We have a tree whose ancestor is at the Alamo. And then we have a hundred uh, such trees as that. We need some uh, work done at the Millennium Grove. Some of the signage um, needs to be replaced. A couple of trees need to be replaced. Eventually there should be a kiosk there so that people can pick up literature. You can take a self-guided tour of the whole uh, 100 and some trees. It will take you about a mile. Uh, the trees are identified by coast, so once you know where the first tree is in history, you know you can stand there, read the plate, and then you can go, it shows you where number two, three, four, all of them are. It's a self-guided tour place. Eventually, it should be used for teaching students and tourists about little snippets of history. We have some literature we developed. We'll leave you some uh, uh, literature that's a little more detailed than, than some of the other. We need a kiosk. We need a shelter, a small shelter attached to that so that people can get in and out of the sun and the rain. There's a place for a picnic area. We need a larger shelter there where people can have reunions, etc., etc. Uh, just a little bit about a, a 
history of one of the trees. We try to write the history so that people will learn something they wouldn't ordinarily have, never, uh, have known. Uh, for instance, we have a tree that is a sycamore tree that's grown from seeds that went to the moon and came back. The, the tree we dedicated to Neil Armstrong. When Neil Armstrong was six, he told his parents he wanted to be a pilot. When he was 16, he got his pilot's license. When he was 17, the Navy sent him to Purdue as a naval re uh, ROTC guy. When he was 20, they pulled him out of college, put him on an aircraft carrier. He flew six, 68 missions over Korea and got shot down. I bet you did not know that Neil Armstrong got shot down over Korea. Anyway, all our histories are like that. Eventually, we want to plant, um, if, if, you, if you go south on Bridge Street and you turn at Granny's Restaurant, uh, you're on East 7th, in the first half block, there's room for 37 tall trees. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what that would look like if you drove down there and saw all those trees? Um, East Water Street, you know where Watt Street is and you know where t Square Drive is? 49 tall trees can be put in there. There's a few, there's a couple of wires so a couple of the trees wouldn't be that tall. But can you imagine what that would look like if it was there? Look at all the presidential streets. Can you imagine what they would look like with trees there? Not easily to plant there because there's fences there, uh, the houses are close to the road and things like that. But there's a lot that can be done with trees. We pledged to plant 100 trees this spring uh, in the East End, uh, we don't have a dime for that, so um, we need some private funds and we need a grant or something of that sort. So now you know more than practically anybody in Chillicothe, and thank you for your time. Thank you, and uh, thank the members of the Tree Commission for, for your service. It uh, does do the community a great uh, deal uh, of good, and I think I was on council when we wrote the original ordinance. It was quite detailed, so again, thank the Commission for their for their service to volunteer service to our community. Any other members of the audience wish to address the council? Going well. My name is John Stevens. I live 522 Seminole Road, and I just wanted to comment on some of the cleanup efforts on the snow. Okay. Point one: we would not have had near the problem if leaves had been picked up in the fall, like you showed. Yeah. Then to top everything off, for the first time in memory, we had a bobcat up there cleaning out storm drains. They hadn't cleared the street till here come the service department and plowed them all back in again. They need to coordinate and get part before the horse. It, it was just a terrible waste of money and effort. If that bobcat had been doing something else, or they had plowed the street first, if they were going to, then put the bobcat in. At one time, almost a whole week, I was the only one that could get out of my driveway on the block. <coughs> and that's only because I run my snowblower up and down the gutter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Any other members of the audience wish to address the council? Going once, going twice. Old business, any council members uh, have any old business they would like to discuss? Ms. Gray? Just a couple of very, very brief things. I just want to say thank you to the mayor and the department heads for submitting their annual reports digitally, electronically, safe to trees. And I want to say thank you for being able to get that out to us on a timely basis. Also wanted to give kudos to the Chillicothe Firefighters, IAFF, Local 300, for the second annual firefighters ball. It was a, a, a nice event. Thank you, Ms. Gray. Any other members of council have any old business they would like to discuss? Okay, moving forward. Petitions and correspondence, Mr. Clerk. Uh, Mr. President, I did receive another uh, of these notices uh, of developments this one is uh, a development on uh, at, or the project address is at 960 Toledo Street and Columbus Street within the city. 
It's a 32 unit uh, multifamily housing development. And this notice is from Quentin Court of Walbuck, Walbuck uh, Development Company out of Lightsfield, Kentucky. And uh, notifies the members of council of this development and of your right to submit comments or objections. Secondly, I did receive uh, another notice from the Ohio Division of Liquor Control, and this one <coughs> pertains to the issuance of a permit to Cardo's Family Fund Center Incorporated of one Nancy Wilson Way within the city. That's all I have, Mr. Right. President. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Any council members have any new business which they would like to discuss? Ms. Gray? Just very, very quickly, just to announce the Colonna's Table Day Breakfast this coming Saturday, March 1st at 8.30 a.m. at the Trinity United Methodist Church. I invite everyone to attend. All right. Thank you. Ms. Ames? Thank you. I received a letter of thanks from Brenda Phillips, Associate Dean at Ohio University of Chillicothe. OUC has an emergency response training center that has fallen into disrepair, and Dr. Phillips is pursuing a grant to refurbish and restore this ERTC so that in the future it can be used as a community resource for first responders, including fire and police for drug remediation training and by industry. I drafted a letter on behalf of the Meth Lab Committee, which was signed by all four members in support of this grant. Dr. Phillips stated that once restored, it should serve as an important resource for increasing safety in our neighborhoods, workplaces, and broader communities. Dr. Phillips appreciated the letter and willingness to partner with OUC for community safety. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Name. Any other new business? Mr. Bronner. Uh, thank you, President Reinhardt. Uh, unfortunately, a few things to bring up here. I know we're going long, but still, this is our job. Uh, <laughs> but you paid the big bucks that's for That's right. <laughs> Ms. Patrick was uh, nice enough to point out to me there after I gave the talk on Parks and Rec. Uh, March 1st is Statehood Day. When we made that date tentative date, we knew that it was Statehood Day. This is in no way trying to be disrespectful to the state of Ohio and the events that could take place. Uh, the way this winter and upcoming spring's going, uh, we just thought if it's a good day, we have to take advantage of it because we don't know how many Saturdays that we're going to be able to work on these fields. And the first games are April 17th. So if you put it off and it's a nice day Saturday, May 1st, or March 1st. Who knows when the next nice, nice Saturday may be. So it was not trying to be disrespectful. And we were cognizant of, of uh, statehood day, but just thought if the weather's good, we kind of have to take advantage of that. Uh, secondly, uh, listening to Ms. Hoffman speak there, uh, very good points. Uh, is there a reason why these uh, positions aren't in the collective bargaining unit? We had the uh, RLS study done. They were not set up to be in the, in the bargaining unit. There are some things that the, uh, the transit clerk uh, deals with um, grant applications through ODOT. Uh, that work is of somewhat confidential nature. Uh, there are budgetary items and, and future planning that, uh, that is, could be considered confidential information. As we discussed at a self-service meeting, the transportation coordinator is a contract job, and it was a decision made jointly at that time between uh, you know, Ms. Hoffman and, and, and myself at, the, at, the, at that meeting that uh, it wouldn't make sense for that to be a union position. So I don't know what the turn of events is today, but uh, we'll discuss it and, and work it out. I will, if there is more discussion to go then, I, I take it we won't waive the, the three read rule matters that were brought up. Council's decision. Okay. Since there is going to be more discussion with the mayor, I hope that we would not uh, waive the three read rule tonight and give us all a chance to get a little bit more facts on these issues. And finally, the, 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 this the, could be old business, could be new business. It's kind of, kind of the point that I'm bringing up. Uh, sometimes you know old and new business, but a lot of times it is old and new business. And we seem to be doing a lot of old and new business in the uh, committee reports. We're kind of getting a little bit ahead of ourselves and out of order. And I don't want to you know, point out anything specifically, but it's, you know, to me it's fairly obvious that a lot of things in committee reports are really old and new business. And 
I found that to get us on that track of doing committee, the committee reports of builds your committee, old and new business to build it, old and new business. Thank you. Any other new business? I'd like to respond to uh, the three total currency issues. I thought we were good to go on it, to be honest. We've had lots of discussion about it. And we had three meetings, if I may, for the Human Resources Committee. And questions have been asked and answered. And we even discussed the possibility of deferring this cause of some unreadiness. But by the same token, we are required as policy to reflect what's already been passed and approved in the budget. These positions, as Auditor Finney has already pointed out, have been approved and were part of the budget in coming forward in 2014. Council was merely doing its job with regard to moving forward with the request. Questions were asked and answered in the committee. I didn't see all of council members in those meetings when questions were discussed, brought up, and we knew prior to today that we need to do this. Because there seems to be some unreadiness, I can defer to one more to hold off on having the three meetings, but we do need to make this. This is already February. By the time we come back, it will be March and ending the third quarter, the first quarter of this year. We need to get this taken care of. The budget's already been approved. We need to have it resolved because we've got monetary financial issues that we're not getting into that need to be addressed, and I don't want to get us into more any difficulty than we already are in. Thank you for that explanation, Ms. Gray. Any other new business? If I, one more, one more point. One of the things, and I, I did mention this, if I'm not mistaken, during the course of the last HR committee meeting regarding these positions, Again, this is a policy issue that we need to make sure that the legislation reflects the budget. If there are any remaining administrative issues, that's in the mayor's court. That's something that the mayor has to take care of with regard to job descriptions, classified versus unclassified. Any of those issues need to be addressed by him with HR. That's not the purview of council. Thank you. Any other new business? Ms. Zane. Um, along the same lines, um, as part of the HR committee, along with Mrs. Patrick and Mrs. Gray, part of our responsibility is to give input and find out what was going on with civil service positions. At our request, the meeting was changed to a time when we could all meet, which was held last week. And at the meeting, we requested a time that we could all meet and the Civil Service Commission said that they had always met at another time and they would continue meeting at this time, which is effectively locking two out of the three human resource people out of attending the meetings. So I would just like to publicly say that I'm disappointed in their unwillingness to make the meeting available for us to attend. Thank you. Any other new business? Committee assignments and meeting date, uh, like a couple of weeks for you guys. Unlike the agenda here, we've got uh, time to get caught up. But uh, since our last legislative meeting on uh, uh, February the 10th, uh, my office has made three um, committee assignments 14 38 to the Development Committee, a request for legislation supporting the CRA tax exemption for the Carlisle Building. I think that is item number 19 this evening. Item 39 to the Engineering Committee, a request for council to investigate the city's participation in modifying the five-way intersection located near North Plaza Boulevard and Nancy Wilson Way. And 14-40 the Engineering Committee, a request for legislation amending Ordinance 50-74 and Section 331.41 of the city's codified ordinances, which prohibits through traffic on through gas slash service station parking lot. And that was 